We're in the new 14th, if you haven't noticed, on the way. On Rue du Noir, at the theater of the same name. She was uh, doing a, it was like, it was a weird place. It was like, in that theater, it was like railroad tracks, old abandoned warehouses, the usual old building with artists squatting or not, who knows. She was doing a spoken word show, something which appeared strange to me and really fascinating at the same time. The audience had been warned on the flyers that no music would be played. I mean, yes, that's probably why you would call it a spoken word. And it would be that it would be also in English. So spoken word, but English, that probably was enough to keep 90% of the uh, French audience out of the room. Uh, I had heard her name before for the first time, probably from getting the 12 inch of Death Valley 69 by Sonic Youth. You know, she was yelling on it. That was definitely very cool and appealing. Uh, most of my student friends and at the time, they, they, they were listening either to Dire Straits or Madonna, you know, the, and the self-proclaimed cool ones were probably never had gone past The Cure or Susie. They must have been the Goths or, you know, Corbeau as we call them here in French. Um, so I went to this spoken word show. Lydia was there with Henry Rollins of the of Black Flag and, and Don, Don Behema, whose name I can never pronounce. Behema. Oh, yeah, oh, there you go. Thank you, Lydia. <laughs> who I had never heard of. Uh, the show was absolutely incredible. I don't really, again, I don't remember what, what uh, Yum uh, did, really. Bye, Yum. Thank you. But Henry did his, you know, usual hilarious stand-up comedy show, you know, and telling his anecdotes of touring. And, you know, just as people were getting all relaxed and ready, ready for more fun, it was time for Lydia to come on stage. <laughs> and she just killed everyone. No prisoners. Did I really? I wish I would have. <laughs> no prisoners were taken. Uh, it was terror in the room. Even the ones who did not speak any English were scared. Imagine the ones who did. It, I was cautiously in the back. The room was small, so I didn't miss anything. I decided that same evening that I would never miss any Lydia's show, whatever form it would be. <laughs> and believe me, there were many, many shows in the last uh, 30 years. Music, spoken word, performance, by herself, with other people, with bands, with men, with women. But it's always Lydia in the center of the stage during the show, because that's what we all come for. So tonight she's going to read from her forthcoming books, So Real It Hurts. And then Ian White, will, um, who's a, a wonderful drummer in many bands, gallon drunk, big sexy noise, will attempt to ask her questions. And he might even get answers. Um, so again, it's really a real pleasure to have Lydia here tonight at the university. I will thank our wonderful University of Chicago authorities that let me do that kind of shit. Maybe they don't know we're doing it, so that's Hopefully not. Right. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I want to thank our dean of the college, John Boyer. I'm sure he doesn't know who Lydia is, but I'll thank him anyhow, because uh, he's sort of letting us do all this. And I have a uh, totally unexpected message. Lydia's very big in uh, North Korea. And uh, <laughs> actually it's South Korea, but just to be contrarian. Yes. Here we go. But Lydia has a really a big fan base out there. And she's uh, Kim Sung In is uh, ill or whatever the fuck his name is. Is a big friend of hers. And he sent through his spokeswoman I love a dictators. little message. Uh, <laughs> let me see, let's get the sound on. Otherwise there's no point. Okay, right. This is Sebastian's cool. creative tendency. No, 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 no. This is real. This is real. This is real time. The video just got in. There she is. Oh, wow. Oh, no. Yes, 
말씀드리겠습니다. 고등 말씀드리겠습니다. 11월 12일 평양부터 절산군 소의 이성 발사당에서 문만도 캐터 은하 3을 통한 광명성 3호 2호기 위성의 발사가 성공했습니다. 위성은 예정된 궤도에 진입했습니다. Support. I will just now turn on the uh, video screen and you can get started. Uh, let's. Excuse me. Did you mean to say I could be? I could yes, my my Supreme, Supreme Leader can now begin her show. Please, Supreme Leader. Sebastian Greppo. Let me just start by saying, the story goes as such. Big Sexy Noise, who Ian White was the drummer of, um, my country rock band, were playing somewhere in France, I don't remember when, not that long ago, 10 years maybe, and Sebastian was there early, and so I approached him and said, excuse me, who are you, and why are you here? And he said, well, I'm Sebastian, <laughs> and like, what do you do? And he said that he worked here at the University of Chicago, Paris, and I said, as I would, and when am I playing there? And he said, oh, soon. And ever since, well, however long ago that, that was, I've decided to make this kind of a place I come to do whatever the fuck I want, and it's in a, kind of, I, to extort money, of course, and to give the university what they deserve, which is some real education. Now, Ian White is going to do a small introduction. Thank you. Okay, yeah. now this is a, uh, an extract from a forthcoming book of Lydia's coming out called So Real It Hurts. Now, this was written by Anthony Bourdain, so uh, I thought it was quite a fitting introduction to this whole thing. So this is what he says. Quote, uh, unquote. Yeah, quote. Lydia Lunch has, she says, never felt shame. She has loudly, consistently, and with astonishing persistence told the world what she thinks, giving exactly zero fucks what the world thought in return. Since arriving in New York in 1976, the product of an abusive and epically awful childhood, she has since been nobody's victim. She became instead a self-described predator, never stopping, always hunting, cutting a swathe through the cultural jungle as the leader of the band Teenage Jesus and the Jerks. Performance artist, underground film icon, and as a truly extraordinary writer, during a period that is still considered a golden time for art, music, and trend dressing, she was always the smartest person in the room. Ha! Which is rarely That's a comfortable hard to me. thing. Which is rarely a comfortable thing to be. As a tenth grade dropout. <laughs> she continues to write sentences so ballistically perfect, so lethally designed, that they always hit their targets and with deadly effect. So tonight she'll be reading from So Real It Hurts, which is the perfect title for this collection. It's a mission statement, a few bleeding slices straight from the butcher's shop. A sampler from an enormous archive of work that will no doubt be poured over by grad students, book lovers, film historians, music nerds, and straight up perverts 100 years from now. Let's hope you choreographers as well. Yeah. All in all, a cross section of sharply written, utterly unsparing, morbidly funny, cruel, painful, but always true stories. Lydia's never turned away from the ugliness or pain in the room. She watched unblinking, told us about it, in either unapologetically self-lacerated confession or a scalding howl of rage. Then she burned the whole motherfucking room and everything in it down to embers. If only! Thank you very much. Um, a little history about the Reverend Ian White and myself. I can't remember, He's, he claims that we met on a plane going to Athens to do a show of what? Improvisational think, music and poetry? Yeah, maybe, yeah. So what year? 15 years ago? 15, 18 years ago. So. 150 years ago. I don't know how we came to be. Was that through <laughs> James Johnson? No, it was probably through somebody else who somebody said, this woman needs somebody to do something. And I said, uh, okay, um, I don't know who this woman is, I don't know what this something is, but nothing. I'll do it. You know, so. Anyway, it didn't matter because uh, Ian and I instantly formed some kind of perverse bond. And over the past 15 years, we've done various forms of music from 
improvisational music with spoken word, illustrated word, which is what I call when I use video and music to illustrate the word. And then we were at a poetry festival in Italy a few years ago, and Ian said, we need to start a hard rock band. Uh, yeah. As you and do we, at a poetry festival. As you do at a poetry festival. And we just said, well, yeah, we both, I don't know, but we said, it has to be big, and it has to be sexy, and it has to be noisy. And so we formed a band called Big Sexy Noise. And since that, we've also done other projects. And he's now on this jaunt been performing his solo material uh, with, with Mark Hurtado and I, who have been doing a tribute to Suicide, the band, not the act. Uh, suicide being my first friends in New York when I landed there in 1976. Anyway, I'm reading from my book, um, So Real It Hurts. This piece is called 1967. And um, The Wire magazine, which is a British alternative magazine, basically about a lot of bad noise rock and horrible jazz, and occasionally a few good things, asked people to write uh, essays about their favorite book or their favorite movie or their favorite album. And so they asked me to write a piece, so I wrote it about my favorite year, which is 1967, when I was eight years old, and this is the story of it. Welcome. Blood buckets down the undulating walls. Invisible fists rage with superhuman strength and hammer the door. The ancient wood frame buckles, crumples, and heaves. The empty nursery reverberates with the mournful howl of a pitiful infant who cannot be located. I'm sitting cross-legged on the floor, clutching my throat, trembling, dry-mouthed, unable to breathe. The Haunting of Hill House is the most terrifying movie I've ever seen. I'm eight years old. A suffocating humidity saturates the night air. Static electricity vibrates the hair follicles. The low buzzing hum of the black and white Motorola TV is swallowed up in the wheezing yelp of a stray dog, which bellows like town criers somewhere in someone's backyard. His harried yapping immediately mimicked and amplified by every mud in the neighborhood, and a round robin of barks and howls, a desperate warning cry which signals the coming maelstrom. The atmosphere stiffens. The dogs retreat. Time bends. In a sudden explosion of white noise, hundreds of frenzied voices come shrieking out of nowhere, as if all hell's fury in a sudden expulsion from Middle Earth materializes, compounding my terror. Men, women, and children who have been hoisted upon the backs of older brothers, all shouting slogans in a demonic gospel fever. Equal work, equal pay, we're black and proud. Say it loud, we're black and proud, black power. The riots, the race riots of 1967 have detoured down Clifford Avenue and are stampeding directly in front of my house. Hammers, baseball bats, pipes, and bricks all employed in the demolition of cars, windows, storefronts a hideous industrial opera of unbearable din. My father, a racist, yet we live in an all-black ghetto, curses, punches the air in his best Marlon Brando as his station wagon crumbles under the endless battery of physical abuse. The ambulance and fire trucks barrel in, splitting the angry throng in two. Their sirens a deafening symphony which exaggerates the cacophony. Police helicopters circle the periphery. Giant mechanical insects whose diabolical hum blankets the shrill. My fear is drowned in sound, but reborn in joy and with flames. The family car is set on fire. I start to laugh maniacally, to dance, to sing, Come on, baby, light my fire. Try to set the night on fire. My father assumes I've lost my fucking mind, and against my insistent protest sends me to my room. I skulk upstairs, dejected. Kind of a drag, mumbled under my breath. A noisy rebellion of violence, clanging, pounding, exciting, and I'm locked out. I can't really comprehend what's happening, but it feels right. I'm no longer frightened, I'm charged up. Zoning in to the collective urgency, the passion, determination. I head to the attic, my hidden retreat, turn on the radio. Now, top 40 radio in 1967 was incredibly insane. White Rabbit by the Jefferson Airplane, Seven Rooms of Bloom, Funky Broadway, The Hunter Gets Captured by the Game, Are You Experienced by Jimi Hendrix, Back to Back. I had no idea what any of these songs were referencing or what they really meant or how subversive they really were. I just used the radio to disappear, to escape from my family, 
to enter another dimension, to melt inside a psychedelic soundstage, which cascaded out through the airwaves, filling my already fractured psyche with a throbbing, slinky, funkified soul music, where soaring rhythms and strangled guitars took me out of myself and gave me goosebumps. I wake up in a cold sweat, James Brown, stimulated me in ways I could only express by shaking my ass, flabbing my arms, and stamping my feet. Jimmy Lee Johnson, the seven-year-old black boy next door, skinny legs and all, had the entire James Brown catalog drop down to one knee and use his sweatshirt as a cape routine down pat. It was the first time anyone flirted with me. I was amazed by his mimicry, his fluidity. His tiny body really knew how to shake a tail feather. He must have caught James Brown on the Ed Sullivan Show. Everybody was glued to the TV on Saturday nights, the Rolling Stones doing Let's Spend the Night Together, the Animals, George Carlin, the best American comedian, all penetrated my unformed psyche, courtesy of Ed Sullivan. Even the infamous Doors controversy where Jim Morrison refused to change, I knew we couldn't get much higher. Subsequently banning the Doors from future appearances struck a raw nerve in my adolescent conscience. Music is the connective tissue between protest, rebellion, violence, sexual awareness, and community. It's just the way it is. Summer of love, what a bold face fucking lie. Reagan was elected governor of California. Lyndon B. Johnson increased troop presence in Vietnam, ignoring the massive demonstrations, which rocked the nightly news. 70,000 people strong in New York City alone protesting. Race riots stormed through Cleveland, Detroit, Watts, Birmingham, Alabama, Rochester, my hometown, New York City, and hundreds of other cities in flaming tensions. Muhammad Ali was stripped of his World Heavyweight Championship for refusing the draft, refusing to go to Vietnam. Carl Wilson of the Beach Boys wouldn't go to war either and got tied up in a five-year league battle, which he eventually won. The Boston Strangler, sideline, was sentenced to life in prison and escaped from the institution he was held in. In 1967, bread was 22 cents a loaf, a gallon of gas was 28 cents, and the inner city ghetto which I called home was brimming with hardworking people with attitude and conviction whose lust for life couldn't be beaten out of them by piss poor housing conditions, lousy pay, the police, or politicians. They taught me to fight for what I believed in, take pride in what I did, never give up, keep the faith, and when hoping for a better tomorrow isn't enough, turn up the goddamn music and dance them blues away. Well, you can take the wigger out of the ghetto, but you can't take the ghetto out of the wigger. And after all, the world is a ghetto. And even though I never forgot my roots, I refused to allow them to strangle me by the ankles because even if I had to beg, borrow, and steal, this lightnings girl was sure to be sure she was making every minute count just like the radio taught me. 1967 helped to define who I was to become. I may have been too young to fully grasp the political implications of the time, but it started a fire <coughs> in my belly that burns as bright today as it ever did. The National Organization of Women was officially incorporated in 1967. Grace Slick and Janis Joplin both threw down at the Monterey Pop Festival. Shirley Temple ran for Congress, and I was just a tiny terror screaming my bloody head off to funky Broadway, already plotting my big city escape. Now, that's when I was eight years old. Kind of a drag. <clears throat> so, I mean, I, the thing I was really wanting to know as well is like, so growing up in a, obviously a ghetto, and you were <coughs> drawn towards music, and so what did that, that obviously brought you some sort of a defense mechanism or something to actually deal with your surroundings, or and what was it about the, the music that actually gave you some sort of hope or some sort uh, well, of exactly. reassurance? Because, I mean, at eight, the radio is all you had. You didn't have, you know, a stereo. You didn't have records. You could only, and because the music was so radical, and even if you didn't know what it was. And even though, I mean, in Britain there were a lot of, you know, um, music shows starting in that period. We did have Ed Sullivan, he had a lot of controversial acts. It just gave you the feeling that that, that was a salvation, that that was some kind of salve to a wound. What's interesting to me is when I wrote this piece, I had to consult my cousins who were 10 years older than I was, and they didn't live in the ghetto, they lived in the suburbs, to just say, 
you know, because my house actually had a <coughs> helicopter crash two blocks away. Um, there were hundreds of people in the street, hundreds arrested. It was right in front of my house while I'm watching a horror movie. But then when I started talking to my cousin, they go, well, that was 67. What about the race riots of 64? And I'm like, wait a minute. So between the ages of five and eight, basically to my psyche, I'm living with a maniac who's my father. I'm living in a war zone, which is a black inner city ghetto. And that highly influenced me. And, and also because I was on the side of the protesters. I don't know how or why. But I didn't remember until my cousin reminded me that there wasn't just one riot I lived through, it was two. Now, that's a mini war for a child. So I think that's what always made me feel as if I'm a one woman army. And I think you can, you know, through your- to ching Through your music, it's obviously, you know, there's a, a lot of, there's a lot of the, that sort of, that movement that from that time, the, certainly the soul, there's a lot of soul in your music and even in, and in the performance that you do, it's it's actually very confrontational. That's quite, you know, it, it's trying to, to get something out of people. But well, also, there's there is there is a very, <coughs> I suppose, a very positive element to. Well, what's it, interesting is nobody has ever accused me of doing soul music except for Ian White, which is great, <laughs> yeah, because he does <laughs> see the soul in my music. I don't do music that's influenced by rhythm and blues, the blues or even any of the bands I name, but they highly influence me. Just because my music, because when I started, when I decided then, so all right, I'm eight. So by 12, when literature came into my life, and I don't even know how because my parents never read a book in their life, but when I found the writing of Henry Miller, Hubert Selby, Genet, the Marquis de Sade, and at 12 started reading, I don't even know how I got these books, um, I felt that there was a hole in literature, more so than even in music, because I wasn't, you know, there was a hole in literature uh, from a, a, not even a female or feminine voice, but we'll call it that if you will, that, that, that there was this vacancy. And that is what really inspired me to start creating. So by 12, I'm writing horrible poetry, of course, but it's what, but the whole, again, the protest of, uh, because I hadn't read any books of protest except the books that the authors I just mentioned, I think, protest against normality. They wrote about their real life uh, in a slightly fictionalized way. And I knew by 12 that I had to do what I was gonna do. I was convinced I knew what I had to do and it was gonna be word-based. And so um, I ran away to New York at 13 for a few days. It was a bit, this was 73 snuck out my basement window, got a ride to the Greyhound station for my girlfriend's father across the street, and we went to New York, which was, so well, 73 to mid 80s was just completely bankrupt, bulldozed, desperate, dark, dirty, wonderful. <laughs> but I knew at 13, <coughs> I better go back and get a little money if I wanted to come back and do something, so I went back to upstate for a while. And um, and this next story is about what happened when I decided to actually <coughs> just say, and I have to give it to, I, I dropped out of, I love speaking at universities because I dropped out of school in the 10th grade because um, my English teacher, I wouldn't read John Steinbeck or other American writers because I'd already read Desaad and I'm like, I'm not reading fucking Graves of Wrath when I've read Philosophy in the Bedroom or a Dialogue Between Priest and a Dying Man or Genet or Thief's Journal or, or Last Action to Brooklyn. I'll write something and my English teacher was wise enough to say to me, you know, you really don't belong here, do you? And I said, you know what? You're really right. And I walked out the fucking door at 15. You're supposed to be 16 to quit school and said, thank you very much. And I have to hand it to her because at that point then, I got a fake ID, got a job, made money, got on the Greyhound again. And this is what the story is. This is called, this is my story about no wave. Okay. I hit Manhattan as a teen terror in 1976, inspired by the manic ravings of Lester Bangs in Cream Magazine the Velvet Underground's sarcastic wit, the glamour of the New York Dolls first album, I love men who dress in drag, and the poetic scat of Piss Factory, 
in my opinion, her best record by Patti Smith. I snuck on my bedroom window, jumped on a Greyhound bus, and crash landed in a bigger ghetto than the one I had just escaped from. But with 200 bucks, which in 1976 was about two grand, but I was always a hustler, in my back pocket in a notebook full of misanthropic rantings, sporting a baby face which belied a hustler's instinct and a killer urge to destroy everything that had inspired me, I didn't really give a flying fuck if the Bowery smelled like dog shit. I wasn't expecting the toilets at CBGB's to be the bookend to Duchamp's urinals, but then again, maybe 1977 had more in common with 1917 than anyone would have imagined. New York City during the late 1970s and early 80s was a beautifully ravaged slag, impoverished and neglected after suffering from decades of abuse and battery. She stunk of sex, drugs, and aerosol paint. Her breath hung heavy, a sweet tubercular, a sticky and vicious thing. She leaked from every pore like a sexy corpse unable to give up the ghost. The succubus that fed on new meat and fresh blood who in turn suckled on her like greedy parasites, alchemizing her putrefaction to a breeding ground of intoxicating fauna. A contaminated nursery overrun with toxic belladonna, a deadly nightshade whose blossoms mocked death by embracing a life which defied death, and I have always defied death, which in turn mocks everything else. Long before the family-friendly gentrification and capital gain criminality whitewashed New York City, thank you Rudolf fucking Giuliani, of all his kaleidoscopic perversion in order to make it safe for anyone who could afford the ridiculous rents charged for shoebox-sized apartments, the Lower East Side played crash pad, shooting gallery, and bordello to dozens of art school dropouts, avant noise musicians, radical poets, no budget filmmakers, and fly on the wall photographers who all lived in glorious squalor in cheap tenement flats spitting distance from each other's front window. A drug fueled, no holes barred, blood soaked pornucopia of art terrorists documenting their personal descent into the bowels of an inferno in a city which felt like the lunatics had taken over the asylum, and they fucking did. Now, creativity acts as a rogue virus spontaneously combusting, splattering the brain matter of its host carrier across a finite terrain for a fleeting amount of time, forever staining the landscape. Hippie radicals flocked to hate Ashbury during the summer of love, seeking revolution before the acid wore off. Heavyweight Southern African Americans migrated north looking for paid work and ended up singing the blues in Chicago in the 1940s. The devil hollered when he caught his great balls of fire in Memphis throughout the 1950s where rock and roll was born. The scandalous theatrics and outrageous decadence of the Weimar Republic in the 1920s fostered both an uprise in prostitution and performance art and made the golden age of Hollywood in the dirty 1930s seem quaint by comparison. The boisterous orgy that begun in Andy Warhol's factory in the swinging 60s had become a bloated technicolor corpse kicked to the curb by gutter punks and no-wave nihilists of the late 1970s, whose idea of a good time was defined by how much noise they could make, how much art they could create, and how much trouble they could cause before the cops arrived to close down the after party. Like the anti-art invasion of Dada and the surrealist pranksters who shadowed them who had a blast while pissing all over everybody's expectations of what art was, No Wave, which I consider myself the queen of, was a collective bowel-cleansing caterall, which spat forth a collective of extreme artists who defied category, despised convention, defiled the audience, refused to compromise, and has consequently influenced and informed pop culture as well as mainstream media ever since. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I can give you a fucking list. It's only a movement in retrospect. Post Alan Vega's pro-punk two-piece appropriately named Suicide, and before pop-punk grunge Sonic Youth, New York City was the devil's dirty litter box. No Wave was the bastard offspring of Taxi Driver, Times Square, Son of Sam, the blackout of 1977, the dud of the summer of love, the hate fuck of Charles Manson, the hell of the Vietnam War, Kent State, Kennedy assassinations. 
It was a mad collective of death-defying miscreants desperate to rebel against the apathetic complacency of a zombie nation, that would be America, dumbed down by sitcoms, disco, fat food, fast food, and professional wrestling. Yes, we were, and some of us still are, angry, ugly, snotty, and loud. We used music and art as a battering ram and a form of psychic self-defense against our own naturally violent tendencies. An extreme reaction against everything the 1960s had promised, but fucking failed to deliver. A collective mania that shot through the night skies of a decade riddled with the aftermath of all the failures and frustrations that had come before it. But beneath the scowls of derision, the antagonism and acrimony, the beautifully hideous harangues and the nearly unbearable shrill, that grotesque soundtrack which our lives defined and which defined our lives, we were howling with delight, laughing like two lunatics at the brink of the apocalypse in a madhouse the size of all New York City, thrilled to be rubbing up against the freaks and outcasts who somehow, for some reason, had all decided to run to Land's End and all at once scream their bloody heads off. Now that was 1976, okay? <laughs> or across the USA. So you're, you know, obviously it's, it's an incredible sort of backdrop of where you I suppose you sort of played music and started, and obviously, you know, to do that you had to be a survivor. It's it's very clear to me when I've talked to you before. I mean, I remember you talking to me about stealing people's electricity from other buildings to survive, stealing food, and if you don't mind me saying, selling drugs on Washington Square, whatever, you know, to Good make drugs, though. to make a living. You know, going down to St. Mark's Place, getting a prescription, saying. Um, I feel a bit overweight. Yeah, can yeah. I, can I, I need have to some? sleep. Can I, <laughs> yeah, I'm can a little I, bit fat. Can yeah. I have some black beauties? Yeah. I need to sleep. Can I have and some uh, Valium? And going down to sell them. Sell them gold then. And I think, it, you know... Well, wait, wait. Let's not forget the best trick of all that I perfected as a young hustler. A yellow notepad on the corner <laughs> yeah. of 6th Avenue and A Street with a pen approaching women with children asking for a dollar for the American Cancer Foundation because children are born with cancer. All I needed was $10 a day to survive in New York then, which is hard to imagine because you need $10 a minute now, literally. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember always asking you, you know, and you, you couldn't even remember really how you survived because nobody, nobody had any means of income. You were well, I can remember this, yeah. is that, for instance, my first apartment that I officially had cost $75, so yeah. $10 a day for 30 days is 300, you need 75 for rent, the rest is for fun. Yeah. <laughs> and do you think, I mean... Well, and I got my name lunch by stealing food from yeah. my hungry friends. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and actually being, because being that, that way, and growing up like that in a way, to, you know, through music and everything, is that why perhaps you've never stood still and you've always, because you know, I've known you for a long time and you've always been somebody who who moves on. No, you never look towards the past. You, you'll only talk about it if you're asked about it. You don't, you don't um, focus on that. Don't romanticize it. And it's not about. It's not necessarily about who you are now and about the future. But you. But I think because of all of that, I've always, I've always thought that that's why you continually move. You continually change. And you're continually searching. For, for, for things to make sense. Well, let's not forget me. I am a multiple schizophrenic well, functioning, yeah, though I am. Well, so, hello, there right, we go. Right. Well, I mean, to me, because time is one long second that goes on forever, it's like I don't need to go back. And the only reason I write something like this piece about No Wave is because, first of all, I do feel I am No Wave from the beginning till now. And No Wave basically means, as I said, um, defiant, not friendly to the audience necessarily, having a very uh, non traditional way of creating uh, and not being victim to anyone's opinion of what it is. And most of the music, I mean, the thing about No Wave, No Wave as music, because No Wave encompasses more than just music, but the music of No Wave, when you hear the word punk or opera or country, you know the parameters of the sound. None of No Wave sounded like the other part of No Wave. So what kind of defined it by what it was not, which was, it was not really even related to each other, which is why I think it's very Dada. And, um, and I, I still feel that no wave is a better term to, to describe what I do, even though I've done rock music, swamp rock, blues rock, cover albums, country <coughs> rock, 
uh, illustrated, psychoambient, and, and, and etc. But I mean, the reason why I go on, as you say, is I'm a conceptualist, or as I like to say, conceptualist. So I have a concept. Then I decide who the appropriate people are to help me create that concept. I never think, oh, I want to work with that person. And I've worked with some incredible people, but they never come first. The concept comes first. And usually, especially in the beginning, sometimes I would have two or three concepts at once. Find the people that did it. I knew it wasn't going to be popular anyway, so why not have three projects, which I always have at least three projects going, um, to describe, which nobody ever, nobody ever seems to get. David Bowie was very inspirational to me because he was such a chameleon. Uh, but I think that because I'm dealing mainly with reality or my version of it, dealing with fact, not fiction, I'm dealing not with, more with the romance of survival or death and surviving beyond that, that I have to find different ways in which to express the same concepts. And that means that if my words are basically going to remain the same, or my point is going to remain the same, if I feel that I'm the mouthpiece for this void that not many other people have filled, especially when dealing with female insanity or psychosexuality, that I have to find different methods of getting those words across, and that means different kinds of musical backdrops. So that's why the music has changed, that's why I've had so many collaborators, and, um, and happy always for collaborators, because well, as you know, what a pleasure it is to work with me. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why don't you yeah. talk about that a little bit there, Ian? <laughs> but I think you, know, you always, you've always, the people who are attracted to you always seem to be in people who are on the margins of society, the people who are disenfranchised, people who, and they, they see something, something incredibly positive and inspirational. You know, I mean, like I, like I did when I first started playing with you. And it's a, it's a continual inspiration to me because you're, you know, and as, as you go along with somebody and you get to know them and you play with them. I mean, sure he's happy, really. I'm going to look at all. Well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've laughed at myself <coughs> almost to death. That's true, he's almost, you know, he's when almost we've, when wet we've himself. When we've been on tour, you know, people might not assume that you're a very uh, incredibly amusing, positive person, but, um, but, but in fact... I think <laughs> I'm fucking hilarious. But, I mean, people tend to paint their fear on my face, like... Because there are so few examples of aggressive, passionate, articulate women, there's not many, no. that she must be a bitch. Excuse yeah. me? Probably the easiest person you've ever worked with. What? Well, without a question. Oh, you yeah. laugh, but no, who but comes on more shows than anybody? No, but it's true. And I think oh, grab the grappler! Yeah. And I think what are you so chuckling about? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I want to hear Sebastian's opinion. You're the easiest person to get along with. You only say I that because I'm your supreme leader. No, no. <laughs> I confirm that. Why? Because uh, I think usually the people who say, oh, Lydia Lunch is a bitch, Lydia Lunch is this, but they're the ones who try to screw around with you and you told them to fuck off and they didn't yeah. accept it. That's the only. If you're nice, if, you do the, if you're the promoter and you pay in time, Lydia will be nice. If you're the audience, I'm usually nice. If you're the audience, if you come drunk at a show, yeah. she I won't be nice. I will have El Grappo the Grappler kick your ass out. <laughs> well, it's, I, again, it's about people painting their fear on my face because they have so few examples of somebody who can be aggressive yet not be. Look, I'm paid to be a bitch. I don't do that in my spare time. Like, nut rolls around, I'm a fucking hedonist. Now, let me tell you where it all started. All right. <laughs> And this is my introduction to my book, So Real It Earns. And this is kind of, well, it's kind of where it all started. It's called Death Defied by a Thousand Cuts. I was born surrounded by death. My mother miscarried before me, after me, and I was born choking the life out of my dead twin brother. At the age of six, my grandmother, a cruel Sicilian witch with long white hair, who smelled of camphor, died in bed while sleeping beside me. For years afterwards, I was chased through the fruit cellar by the evil apparition of her heinous cackle. My mother was surrounded by death, too. Eleven brothers and sisters, only three of which lived to see adulthood. Pneumonia, tuberculosis, cancer, diabetes, stroke, a sick brood indeed. I spent my formative years in a town where the future hillside strangler, Kenneth Bianchi, conducted his first experiments in lust killings. Month after month, the lurid details of his latest victim, always a pre-adolescent girl my age at the time, 
would be splayed across the evening news or the front page of the daily paper, grid marking the map of bodies I was convinced I was next to join. Years later, I survived a cocaine-induced killing spree by satanic heartthrob Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, who must have gotten his psychic signals crossed when instead of sneaking into my bungalow for a few carefree hours of hard metal and soft flesh, took a left turn and missed my apartment by a mere three blocks. Although at the time the advanced stages of a sick addiction to adrenaline and the endless possibility of death's black magnetism, I felt as if I had already spent many a new moon subjugated to the Night Stalker's unique charisma. Richard Ramirez never knew me, but I felt as if we were dating. By nature, I am death defiant. I have survived illnesses which have killed us or mortals, burst appendix, infected lymph nodes, E. coli, unintended intraoperative awareness, the result of an undetected and unwanted ectopic pregnancy which exploded, filling my body with pus and poison blood, causing me to black out until I woke up seizing with the unbearable horror of being paralyzed under a Russian surgeon's vicious butchery in a scuzzy community hospital in downtown Los Angeles. I was surrounded by blinding white light, which was in fact not the light, but the fluorescent overheads, which I floated eye level with while silently screeching and beseeching every god, goddess, and demon whom I thought worthy of summoning as I begged for death, begged for relief, begged to be set free from what I assumed was hell's ultimate punishment, eternal, unceasing, unrelenting physical pain. That's what happens when you wake up on the operating table. Not enough anesthesia will do that to a fucking person. I've been stabbed in the gut an eighth of an inch short of pancreatic poisoning. I've been forced into the desert by a Charles Manson wannabe whose idea of true romance was bloodstains and the sun-bleached sand. I've been bottled in the forehead with a full Heineken bottle, which with such brute force that it broke. It's been a charming weekend with a sexy drifter who was arrested three days later and charged with cannibalism. I've been held hostage in snowy woods by a Robert Blake look-alike holding a sawed-off shotgun to my left temple, demanding to be told horrible fairy tales detailing a dozen ways in which I would murder my sisters. I bullied a junkie gunman to put his piece back in his pocket, turn around, walk away from me, and go shoot someone else from his own neighborhood. I guilt-tripped a knife-wielding crack tweaker to head up town where people were actually worth sticking up. I'd been on two transatlantic fights, flights which were stalled on European runways for hours while bomb-sniffing dogs were sent through the luggage hold to retrieve deadly explosives. And this all happened in the early 80s. I taunted death and death taunted back. But like a lover who sweet talks you with endless promises of fantastic potential but always comes up short in the pants, you eventually grow bored with possibility. And the attraction you once swooned with now sours and leaves you cold. Besides, death, so they say, is forever. Life no matter how much you torture yourself or allow others to pick up the pillory and nail you to a post, is goddamn short. I mean, sea turtles do live longer. I'm grateful for every moment I'm still alive. I've been granted numerous days of execution. I courted death, who always wins in the end, but truly, I wanted life, life in the extreme. I needed experiences which would force me to truly appreciate everything. I wanted to take nothing for granted. A friend once said, oh, shut the fuck up. You've got it made. You had everything you ever wanted, all the sex you could stomach, all the drugs you could consume, cool friends who worship you. What more do you want? Well, everything. Oh, I was glutting on everything in a desperate attempt to feel something, anything. I wasn't born numb to life, but the trauma of birth, repeated exposure to the violence of alcoholism and the rage of its impotence, poverty, night terrors had short-circuited my emotional hard drive before I even hit puberty. I fought long and hard to get sensation back. And yeah, I'm a fucking contrarian. On one hand, I simply don't give a fuck. Trust me on that. I could be a self-centered alien fembot soldiering forward in spite of the imminent collapse of my own physical and mental well-being, chortling sadistically as the planet crumbles. On the other hand, I'm war-torn, battle-fatigued, and deeply wounded by humanity's ignorance, stupidity, and greed. 
My compassion is a driving force, which insists I give voice to the murdered sons and battered daughters who are forever looking for love in all the wrong faces because they don't know how to love themselves enough while hating everything and everyone else, and that I am an expert in. Most people suffer from having too much emotion. They obsess over minor imperfections, comparing themselves to unrealistic images perpetrated by celebrity-driven media who value net worth or content or meaning. They panic in the face of disapproval or contradiction, fearing that if they disagree with the status quo or the general consensus or a lover's opinion of right and wrong, they will be abandoned and left to fight it out alone. Their insecurity is exaggerated by jealousy, which in turn fosters such a desperate need to be understood that they'll waste an exorbitant amount of time and energy pitching temper tantrums, riddled with endless tirades, berating friends and lovers who just don't get me. Energy and emotion, which could and should be more fruitfully employed in the written and spoken word, where if somebody doesn't want to hear it, they aren't forced to listen. And if they don't get it, tough shit. I mean, no one made any of you come here tonight. I know it was free, but so fucking what? You still had to come here. You came here because I, I truly believe that you need to vent some poison too, or some part of you has felt poisoned or traumatized, and you want a voice of reason, a voice of compassion. And I hope that in turn, what I do and what I say inspires you to scream, but not in your lover's face. Have you ever heard me scream off stage? Ever? No. <laughs> Can you, hey, let's just pause for a minute. Maybe, maybe He's known me for 15 maybe, fucking years. Maybe longer, 18, I think it might be. Have you but, ever heard me scream at anybody when I wasn't getting paid to do so? Not, not, Sebastian? not, not unless they, they crossed you. And, yeah, so. <laughs> now, I may have slapped or punched people, but that's because they no, usually no. ask me. When we yell, I'm paid to yell. I hope it inspires you to scream, not in your lover's face but into the bottomless void of the eternal night backlit on some shitty stage, holding your guts out, seeking purgation, surrounded by a handful of hungry orphans desperate for the nourishment of creation's awful. I'm Lydia Lunch, and that's my fucking story. Yeah, yeah. Let's get this out. I mean, you know, again, it's, um, it strikes me that, that you, never, you have never slowed down. You've never, you've never actually mellowed. You've never really, you know. And so you, you still have that same, you still have that same need and passion. that same passion to do this, you know. And you still have the same adrenaline. So do you still feed off that, that, that rush, that, that, that need to do it? You need know? to be. Well, look. First of all, since I never sleep, I have a lot of spare time on my hands. You never sleep. It's no. ridiculous. Have you ever seen me sleeping? I've seen you. Uh, no, I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I, well, he doesn't sleep much either. But, but no, but I mean... He does search auto, but... You have like an hour, and then you're up, and then an hour, and then, then it's... I'm ridiculous. not driven awake because my mind is in overdrive. I'm driven awake because my body is in overdrive, and I don't have enough toys to play with at the moment. That's all right. Um, when I first knew I had to start doing something, and, and I knew it had to be spoken word, but there wasn't spoken word at that time because it was post-beat generation, it was post Patti Smith rock poetry. But I, at the same time, strangely enough, Henry Rollins and Jello Biafra and Exine Cervenka, because of the politics of America, we all decided um, the East and the West Coast to start doing spoken word. But the reason I first started writing was because it, uh, whatever my story was, I knew my story wasn't the worst story. I know I had to speak for other people as well. My story is not the worst one. So I grew up in a ghetto, so my father was a maniac. So, eh. I also had a lot of good times. My father would also drive me to rock concerts and pick me up at 2 o'clock in the morning at the age of 13, thank you very much. So whatever his mania was, a lot of people have it much worse, but they can't necessarily talk about it. So I always felt it was my job, and I guess why I'm still propelled to do this is is if someone would come up and help me here, uh, verbally, on stage, I don't feel I have had cultural impact. So don't name Riot Girls, because they're not my progeny, because that's just lousy punk rock music. And, and it's not that I wish I could pass the torch. It's that at around the age of 14, I felt like I would be the oldest living woman of rage, and I would have to just keep 
doing it. And it's not only for me. It's because other people somehow, even if their life doesn't encompass any of this shit I just talked about, they have some wound. They have some trauma. They have some otherness. They have some need to hear a voice, which they hear nowhere else, and then happens to be mine. So. And you never, you never seem to tire of people coming to you, you know, after gigs, after performances, whatever. And they, they will unburden Mother themselves. Mother Teresa. No, but it's true. I mean, I've, you know, I've seen it for years and years. And, and they unburden themselves, and you know, they leave. They always seem to leave. In a better place, actually, strangely. A enough, hug can mean a lot yeah. to people, and it's like, look, yeah. I can't solve anybody. It's just, no, but. and again, it, it's not that the problems are the same, the issues are the same, but it's that the wound might be similar. And you don't get tired of hearing. Of course, I fucking do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but I mean, the, people. I mean, it's so little. They want so little means so much. So yes, it's like, can I have a selfie? Can I have a selfie? Uh, and then they never want to show you. That's very annoying. It's like, excuse me, I know the app. flash, higher up. If I have to say that one more thousand times, I'm sure I will. But so little, if so little, I mean, an autograph. That's so silly to me. No. But if that means something to someone, and by the way, we're going to be selling. I don't have copies of the book I just read from. That I have copies of Paradoxia, and we'll work for drugs in French. Sorry for all of you English speakers. And some big sexy noise CDs that if anybody wants to buy them, since you got them for fucking free, support an artist. But I mean, if so little means so much to people, I can't. I'm yeah, but I, I also I also mean you know when when you know people will come to you and say I heard your or I heard your performance or I saw something when I was really young. Uh, that that means everything to me. Yeah, and I mean, I, I mean, that's an incredible thing to know. Even if it's, even if one person in the world is, you, you've actually, you've given sort of some sort of hope, some sort of strength to that. But I mean, of course, there's, there's hundreds of people. There are I mean, maybe that, dozens. You know, but that's, maybe thousands. That's an amazing, what else? yeah, thousands, million. That's an amazing, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's an amazing, amazing thing. Millions, only half of them are dead. Yeah. Um, what's interesting to me is when people come up and say, oh, I love your music, and I'm like, which era? <laughs> and I'm not being a dick about that. It's just that because I've been performing for 42 years, like 20 years longer than some of you have been alive, it, 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 it gives me kind of an insight into what type of music they might have picked up on. Like, they thought, oh, that was goth, 13, 13, that was swamp rock, or that was rolling, that was... so it's kind of interesting to me because there's few, they, it could be people that like all of my music. Certainly, I don't make my music to be liked by everybody or even anybody. I don't give a shit. But it's interesting when, you know, you just don't give me a blanket statement. Oh, I like your music. Oh, you really wish? What, what album would that be of the 400 songs I've written? It, it's just interesting to me because it might have been a period of their life where that record meant something to them. And it, it's not that I can define them by that. But it just gives me that small insight. It's interesting because then they often just start flushing like ah, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> suddenly blank. They might yeah. have heard three hundred yeah. songs and like oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any questions or answers? Answers. That's what I'd love to hear. Some answers. Anybody got any answers? <laughs> yeah, I have an answer. Great. I think you come into people's lives at the exact right moment for them. I only hope so. Because I've lived this long. And what, you mean the 22? Fuck no. I don't know, look right. <laughs> you look right. We do look good. We look fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because I've lived this long and somehow or another... And when did I come into your life? Just this minute. Excellent! Oh, wow! wow. <laughs> I love that! I'm just fucking amazed that somehow or another that. I've danced around you my whole entire I love life. That. Oh, that's that. See, that to me is it's bizarre. But when people, for whatever strange reason, suddenly drop in, I'm very happy about that. It was a therapeutic <laughs> invitation. Not, not, not as happy as I am, believe me. Would this you is... like copies of this? Yes, <laughs> please. Can I have them? Yes. Fuck. Changing my life here, woman. I have both. Thank you. That, I mean, see, I love that because yeah. she's saying it's at the right moment. I don't even know, but I'm sure it is the right moment in your life. I, I didn't know how much I needed you. I'm here for you, baby. Can we have a yeah. hug? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, my God. You are amazing. There's a nice. Liz. Hi, Liz. You know, my parents used to call me Liz. They were too lazy to say Lydia. 
And I would go to Lizzie Borden, and drop her and gave her parents 40 bucks. And you know what? My last name is Boder, and people have been saying Lizzie Borden to me. Excellent. I knew when I first saw you, we had some connection. There we go. Thank you. And that's, see, now that's a great answer. Anything else? Anybody? Snacks? Yeah. Drinks? Hi, how are you? Hey. <laughs> um, yeah, what, what, what made me feel um, really close to you? Maybe not close, but what, what was a very good um, figure to me was that strength that you sometimes, not sometimes, always exert. Uh, and what you said earlier about women being able to be aggressive and to say no, People don't like that a woman saying no. Or to or say they, yes. They don't even like a woman saying yes aggressively. Yeah, that's true. Very true. It's like, fuck off, I will say yes or no. Yeah, and I might be wrong, but I have the feeling that uh, maybe now they tend to cut the group. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to use a French expression. Go ahead. In English. Sebastian, use a French. You couldn't say it in French. Yeah, a coupé l'arme sous pied, like you, you don't even have the time, like you don't even have the time to build something. They really don't want that now, even less than maybe a few years ago, a few decades ago, and so if, because I, okay, I'm 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 just starting to 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 be on stage and to play my music, and it feels like you really don't have to. They they don't want you to to be too much. Um, you just have to say to to wait for people to call you. If you if you even make one step, they're gonna take that as something very aggressive. Even if you know, you know what, and tough shit for them because if they weren't so weak, they wouldn't think that we were so fucking I know, aggressive. I know, and I'm not most of the time, but they feel that as like, just asking a question, it feels to them like well, then you're dealing with pussies. And <laughs> oh, pussy is much more strong than. <laughs> Insult the female yeah. anatomy, but you know you have to just barrel on and do what you do, and you can't bow down to their expectations. Yeah. And it's getting it is worse now. It yeah. is worse now That's because I, I mean, look, in the for instance, in the seventies, we didn't have gender issues like this. There were women doing films, photography, graffiti, art, and music. Yeah. We didn't care, and we didn't have like there didn't feel like there was in New York sexism at that time because you know what we were having sex and fuck you if you don't like it yeah. because as the as the perker after the sexual revolution of the 60s we weren't just going to say lotty dotty we were going to wait for it we were going to take it yeah. and we took it and there was you no know, there was all this petty millennial stuff now that if you look at me wrong excuse yeah. me you know what if i don't like the way you're looking at me i'm going to tell you and if you don't want, you know, you touch me wrong, trust me, I can crush your dick. <laughs> yeah, if only women realized how sensitive a nutsack was, the whole story would be very different. You do that, it's pretty much over. And if not, learn how to throw a punch. It's very easy. Right there in the throat, it's done. <laughs> and why mothers don't teach daughters that at six, I don't know. I'm not blaming the victims, I blame their fucking mothers. Teach them. <laughs> it's over. Trust me. That on a ball sack, the end of the night. You know, in America, they might use guns and knives. Here, they just try to use intimidation. It ain't gonna fly by me. Yeah. I haven't met a dick I couldn't crack. <laughs> you just get on that thing, go hard to the left, it's done. Go to the, they'll have an eggplant in the emergency room. And <laughs> I mean, it's only six fucking inches. Really? We weigh what? We don't even need to know. Six inches about what? Two ounces. <laughs> I'm like 150 good pounds, honey. I dare you. <laughs> really? I, I think I'm in the winning. I think I have, I have the winning hand. I got two fucking hands. You got one dick. Yeah. You want to try me? Go ahead. <laughs> Excuse me, did you have a question, Sebastian? <laughs> or an answer? Uh, no, no, I was just saying we could uh, continue on if there are more questions. We also have some drinks and drinks and snacks. And snacks. Any, anybody else want to make a statement? A statement. I, 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 a yes. Question, you talk about periods of your work, and there's one there's one phrase of yours, I believe it's yours, that echoes through my head every single time I'm sort of faced with a particular knot of libidinal confusion that people are enacting in front of me, and it's like this is a ba a ballad of sex as an animal act. Fucked up, up by, by your emotions. emotions. Uh, it explains everything. <laughs> all right, I, I will just quote him quoting me. A battle of sex as an animal act fucked up by your emotions. Thank you. That's the, Is that uh, pretty much is it. 
Party. You know, I don't know when women decided they weren't going to win that war of the battle of sex. Because really, first of all, we can multiple orgasm. Second of all, we can squirt and drown you. Third of all, we can crack a dick. Fourth of all, you got two nuts, we got two fists. I don't know when women decided we weren't winning the fucking battle of sex. I don't get it. And I will take on all comers. Anybody thinks that they're going to dominate this bitch, well, they might have to pay for that. <laughs> and get hurt afterwards. Cheers. Cheers. Anything else? I love how you meant your, your phrase, art terrorists. This resonates for me because I believe that you are the living embodiment of everything that punk rock aspired to be. Thank you very much. Because punk rock to me was just a fashion statement and a social issue. But I, but what it aspires exactly. to be in its highest form. Right. Is Thank you. you very much. And and uh, you know I. I am what New York once was. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so very I much. believe that with their. I consider myself punch rock actually. Okay. But that's just what I like to do. Or punch rock. Right. Punk rock. Punk rock. That's big sexy noise. Punk rock. Big sexy noise. Main song is your love don't pay my fucking rent. You can look it up, honey. It's on YouTube. <laughs> Trust the bitch. Awesome. Anything else? Anybody? Kid, you got a question or you got an answer? No. But you said you, you, you like when people tell you what kind of music they like. Yeah, to well, of course. But what if they like the the icon that you are? Do you like that? Well, what icon that I have? <laughs> they do. They do. I hear them talking. They, well, they like, like my look. It's, it's not. A, no, it's well, not. What, what do you mean? Look. I don't know what you mean exactly. I mean, I don't know. It's like some kind that has to do with. Obviously, music, but you also know, I'm not gonna tell them what to like or not like. I don't really. It's only when I meet them personally do I give a shit. I can't care what what goes on behind my. And also, you know, I don't do social media. I don't do Twitter. I don't do Instagram. Sebastian runs my Facebook. Don't leave a fucking comment because nobody will read it. It's really a billboard. I if you want to be my friend or talk to me, I want to look you in the eyes. Yeah. Otherwise, it's ass book. All right, ask Cloud Book. I know that's helpful for some people, but for me, I don't have the time. I like to see people one on one, and I will talk to anybody, but I do not have time to read graffiti on a bathroom wall. <laughs> Anything else before we have snacks and drinks? <laughs> snacks and drinks! Snacks and drinks. <laughs> Yeah. Not? That's all right, too. Oh, I can't. I can't. I'm never going to